We're going to go on time, day five. Below them, the town is laid out in harsh, angular patterns. The houses in the outskirts were all exactly alike, small square boxes painted gray. Each had a small rectangular plot of land, lawn in front, with a straight line of dull-looking flowers edging the path to the door. Meg had a feeling that if she could count the flowers, there would be exactly the same number for each house. In front of all the houses, children were playing. Some were skipping rope, some were bouncing balls. Meg felt vaguely that something was wrong with it. Their play. It seemed exactly like children playing around any housing development at home, and yet there was something different about it. She looked at Calvin and saw that he, too, was puzzled. Look, Charles Wall said suddenly, they're skipping and bouncing in rhythm. Everyone's doing it at exactly the same moment. This was so. As the skipping rope hit the pavement, so did the ball. As the rope curved over the head of the jumping child, the child with the ball caught the ball. Down came the ropes, down came the balls. Over and over again, up, down, all in rhythm. All identical, like the houses, like the paths, like the flowers. Then the doors of all the houses opened simultaneously, and out came women, like a row of paper dolls. The print of their dresses was different, but they all gave the appearance of being the same. Each woman stood on the steps of their house. Each clapped, each child with the ball, caught the ball. Each child with the skipping rope folded the rope. Each child turned and walked into the house. The doors clicked shut behind them. How can they do it? Meg asked wonder wonderingly. How we couldn't do it that way if we tried. What does it mean? Let's go back. Calvin's voice was urgent. Back? Charles Wallace asked. Where? I don't know. Anywhere? Back to the hill? Back to Miss What's it? Mrs. Who and Mrs. Which? I don't like this. But they aren't there. Do you think they'd come to us if we turned back now? I don't like it, Calvin said again. Come on. Impatience made Meg squeak. You know we can't go back. Mrs. Which said to go into the town. She started on down the street and the two boys followed her. The houses, all identical, continued as far as the eye could reach. Then all at once they saw the same thing, and they stopped to watch. In front of one of the houses stood a little boy with a ball, and he was bouncing it. But he bounced it rather badly, and with no particular rhythm, sometimes dropping it and running after it with awkward, furtive leaps, sometimes throwing it up into the air and trying to catch it. The door of his house opened, and out ran one of the mother figures. She looked wildly up and down the street, saw the children and put her hand to her mouth, as though to stifle a scream, grabbed the little boy and rushed indoors with him. The ball dropped from his fingers and rolled out into the street. Charles Wallace ran after it and picked it up, holding it out for Meg and Calvin to see. It seemed like a perfectly ordinary brown rubber ball. Let's take it in to him and see what happens, Charles Wallace suggested. Meg pulled at him. This is what it said for us to go on into the town. Well, we are in the town, aren't we? The outskirts, anyhow. I want to know more about this. I have a hunch it may help us later. You go on if you don't want to come with me. No, Calvin said firmly. We are going to stay together. Mr. Wessel said we want to let them separate us. But I'm with you on this. Let's knock and see what happens. They went up the path to the house. Meg reluctant, eager to be to get out get on into the town. But hurry, she begged. Please. Don't you want to find father? Yes, Charles Wall said, but not blindly. How can we help him if we don't know what we're up against? And it's obvious we've been brought here to help him, not just to find him. He walked briskly up the steps and knocked at the door. They waited. Nothing happened. Then Charles Wall saw a bell, and this he rang. They could hear the bell buzzing in the house, and the sound of it echoed down the street. After a moment, the mother figure opened the door. All up and down the street, other doors opened, but only a crack, and the eyes peered toward the three children and the woman, looking fearfully out the door at them. What do you want? she asked. It isn't paper time yet. We've had milk time. We've had this month's polar crush person. I've given my decency donations regularly. All my papers are in order. I think the little boy dropped his ball, Charles Wallace said, holding it out. The woman pushed the ball away. Oh no. The children in our section never drop balls. They're all perfectly trained. We haven't had any aberration for three years. All up and down the block, heads nodded in agreement. Charles Wallace moved closer to the woman and looked past her into the house. Behind her in the shadows, he could see the little boy, who must have been about his own age. You can't come in, the woman said. You haven't shown me any papers. I don't have to let you in if you haven't any papers. Charles Wallace held the ball out beyond the woman so that the little boy could see it. Quick as a flash, the boy leapt forward and grabbed the ball from Charles Wallace's hand and darted back into the shadows. The woman went very white opened her mouth as though to say something, and slammed the door on their faces and said, all up and down the street, the doors slammed. What are they afraid of? Charles Wallace asked. What's the matter with them? Don't you know? Meg asked him. 
Don't you know what all this is about, Charles? Not yet, Charles Wallace said. Not even an inkling, and I'm trying. I, but I didn't even get through anywhere. Not even a chink. Let's go. He stumped down the steps. After several blocks, the houses gave way to apartment buildings. At least Mike felt sure that that was what they must be. They were fairly tall, rectangular buildings, absolutely plain, each window, each entrance, exactly like every other. Then coming toward them, down the street, was a boy about Calvin's age, running a machine that was something like a combination of a bicycle and a motorcycle. It had the slimness and lightness of a bicycle, and yet, as the foot pedals turned, they seemed to generate an unseen source of power, so that the boy could pedal very slowly, and yet move along the street quite swiftly. As he reached each entrance, he thrust one hand into a bag he wore slung over his shoulder, pulled out a roll of papers, and tossed it into the entrance. It might have been Dennis or Sandy, or any one of hundreds of boys with a newspaper around in any one of hundreds of pounds back home. And yet, as with the children playing ball and jumping rope, there was something wrong about it. The rhythm of the gesture never varied. The paper flew in an identical same arc at each doorway, landed in identically the same spot. It is impossible for anybody to throw with such consistent perfection. Calvin whistled. I wonder if they play baseball here. As the boy saw them, he slowed down on his machine and stopped. His hand arrested as it was about to plunge into the paper bag. What are you kids doing out on the street? He demanded. Only route boys are allowed out now. You know that. No, we don't. No, no we don't know about it, said Charles Wallace. We are strangers here. How about telling us something about this place? You mean you've had your entrance papers processed and everything? The boy asked. You must, ha must have if you're here, he answered himself. And what are you doing here if you don't know about us? You tell me, Charles Wallace said. Are you examiners? The boy asked, a little anxiously. Everybody knows our city has the best central intelligence center on the planet. Our production levels are the highest. Our factories never close. Our machines never stop rolling. Added to this, we have five poets, one musician, three artists, and six sculptors, all perfectly channeled. What are you quoting from? Charles Wallace asked. The manual, of course, the, ball, the boy said. We're the most oriented city on the planet. There's been no trouble of any kind for centuries. All Kalamazoo's knows our record. That is why we are the capital city of Kamazots. That is why central c central intelligence is located here. That is why it makes ho its home here. There was something about the way he said it that made a shiver run up and down Meg's spine. But Charles Wallace asked briskly, where is the central intelligence center of yours? Central, central, Intel central, central, the boy corrected. Just keep going and you can't miss it. You are, stran you are strangers, aren't you? What are you doing here? Are you supposed to ask questions? Charles Wallace demanded severely. The boy went white, just as the woman had. I humbly beg your pardon. I must continue my route. Now or I will have to talk my timing into the exp explainer. And he shot off down the street on his machine. Charles Wallace stared after him. What is it? He asked Megan Calvin. There was something funny about the way he talked, as though, well, as though he weren't really doing the talking. You know what I mean? Calvin nodded thoughtfully. Funny is right. Funny peculiar. Not only the way he talked either, the whole thing smells. Come on, Meg pulled at them. How many times was it she had urged them on? Let's go, find Father. He'll be able to explain it all to us. They walked on. After several more blocks, they began to see other people, grown-up people, not children, walking down, up and down and across the streets. These people ignored the children entirely, seeming to be completely intent on their own business. Some of them went into the apartment buildings. Most of them were heading in the same direction as the children. As the pe these people came to the main street from the side streets, they would swing around the corners with an odd automatic stride as though they were so deep in their own problems and the route was so familiar that they didn't have to pay any attention to where they were going. After a while, the apartment buildings gave way to what must have been office buildings, great stern structures with enormous entrances. Men and women with briefcases poured in and out. Charles Wallace went up to one of the women, saying politely, Excuse me, could you please tell me? But she hardly glanced at him as she continued on her way. Look, Meg pointed. Ahead of them, across the square, was the largest building they had ever seen, higher than the Empire State Building, and almost as long as it was high. This must be it, Charles Wallace said. They're central, central intelligence, or whatever it is. Let's go on. But if father's in some kind of trouble with this planet, Meg objected, isn't that exactly where we shouldn't go? Well, how do you propose finding him? Charles Wallace demanded. I certainly wouldn't ask there. 
I didn't say anything about asking, but we aren't going to have the faintest idea where or how to begin to look for him until we find out something more about this place. I have a hunch that that's the place to start. If you have a better idea, Meg, why, of course, just say so. I won't get down off your high horse, Meg said crossly. Let's go to your old central, central intelligence and get it over with. I think we ought to have passports or something, Calvin suggested. This is much more than leaving America to go to Europe. And that boy and the woman both seem to care so much about having things in proper order. We certainly haven't got any papers in proper order. If we needed passports or papers, Mrs. What's It would have told us so, Charles Wallace said. Calvin put his hands on his hips and looked down at Charles Wallace. Now look here, old sport. I love those three old girls just as much as you do, but I'm not sure they know everything. They know a lot more than we do, granted. But you know Mrs. What's It talked about having been a star. I wouldn't think that being a star would give her much practice in knowing about people. When she tried to be a person, she came pretty close to goofing it up. There was never anybody on land or sea like Mrs. What's It the way she got herself up. She was just having fun, Charles Wallace said. If she'd wanted to look like you or Meg, I'm sure she could have. Calvin shook his head. I'm not so sure. And these people seem to be people, if you know what I mean. They aren't like us. I grant you that. There's something very offbeat about them, but there's lots more like ordinary people than the ones on Muriel. Do you suppose they're robots? Meg suggested. Charles Wallace shook his head. No, that boy who dropped the ball wasn't any robot. I don't think the rest of them are either. Let me listen for a minute. <clears throat> they stood very still, side by side, in the shadow of one of the big office buildings. Six large doors kept swinging open shut, open shut as people went in and out, in and out, looking straight ahead, straight ahead, paying no attention to each other whatsoever, whatsoever. Charles Wallace wore his listening, probing look. They're not robots, he said suddenly and definitely. I'm not sure what they are, but they're not robots. I can feel minds there. I can't get at them at all, but I can feel them sort of put pulsing. Let me try a minute more. The three of them stood very quietly. The doors kept opening and shutting, opening and shutting, and the stiff people hurried in and out, in and out, walking jerkily like figures in an old silent movie. Then abruptly, the stream of movement thinned. There were only a few people, and these moved more rapidly, as if the film had been sped up. One white-faced man in a dark suit looked directly at the children and said, Oh dear, I shall be late, and flickered into the building. He's like the white rabbit, Meg giggled nervously. I'm scared, Charles said. I can't reach them at all. I'm completely shut out. We have to find Father, Meg started again. Meg, Charles Wallace's eyes were wide and frightened. I'm not sure I'll even know, Father. It's been so long, and I was only a baby. Meg's reassurance came quickly. You'll know him. Of course you'll know him. The way you'd know me, even without looking, because I'm always there for you. You can always reach in. Yes, Charles punched in one small fist into an open palm with a gesture of great decision. Let's go to Central, Central Intelligence. <clears throat> Calvin reached out and caught both Charles and Meg by the arm. You remember when we met? You asked me why I was there. I told you it was because I had a compulsion, a feeling. I had just to come to that particular place at that particular moment. Yes, sure. I've got another feeling. Not the same kind. A different one. A feeling that we, if we go into that building, we're going into terrible danger. Chapter 7. The Man with Red Eyes. We knew we were going to be in danger, Charles Wall said. Mrs. Wetzel told us that. Yes, and she told us that it was going to be worse for you than for Mag and me. And then you must be careful. You must stay right here with Mag, old sport, and let me go in in case the joint and then report to you. No, Charles Wall said firmly. She told us to stay together. She told us not to go off by ourselves. She told you not to go off by yourself. I'm the oldest, and I should go in first. No, Mag's voice was flat. Charles is right, Cal. We have to stay together. Suppose you didn't come out, and we had to go in after you. Mm hmm Come on. But let's hold hands, if you don't mind. Holding hands, they crossed the square. The huge central central intelligence building had only one door, but it was an enormous one, at least two stories high and wider than a room, made of dull, bronze-like material. Do we just knock? Meg giggled. Calvin studied the door. There isn't any handle or knob or latch or anything. Maybe there's another way to get in. Let's try knocking anyhow, Charles said. He raised his hand, but before he touched the door, it slid up from the top and to each side, splitting into three sections that had been completely invisible a moment before. The startled children looked into a great entrance hall of dull, greeny marble. Marble benches lined three of the walls. People were sitting there like statues. The green of the marble reflecting on their faces made them look bilious. They turned their heads as the door opened, saw the children, looked away again. Come on, Charles said. 
and still holding hands, I stepped in. As they crossed the threshold, the door shut silently behind them. Meg looked at Calvin and Charles, and they, what like the waiting people, were a sickly dream. The children went off to the bank, the blank fourth wall. It seemed un unsubstantial, as though one might almost be able to walk through it. Charles put out his hand. It's solid and icy cold. Calvin touched it too. Ugh. Meg's left hand was held by Charles, her right by Calvin, and she had no desire to let go of either of them to touch the wall. Let's ask somebody something. Charles led them over to one of the benches. Er, can you tell us what the procedure around here? He asked one of the men. The men all wore nondescript business suits, and though their features were as different one from the other as the features of men on earth, there was also a sameness to them, like the sameness of people riding in a subway, Meg thought. Only on a subway every once in a while there's somebody different, and here there isn't. The man looked at the children warily. The procedure for what? How do we see whoever's in authority? Charles asked. You present your papers to the aid machine. You ought to know that, the man said severely. Where is the aid machine? Calvin asked. The man pointed to the blank wall. But there isn't a door or anything, Calvin said. How do we get in? You put your S papers in the B slot, the man said. Why are you asking me these stupid questions? Do you think I don't know the answers? You'd better not play any games around here, or you'll have to go through the process machine again, and you don't want to do that. We're, <clears throat> we're strangers here, Calvin said. That's why we don't know anything about things. Please tell us, sir. Who are you, and what do you do? I run a number one spelling machine on the second grade level. What are you doing here now? Charles Wallace asked. I'm here to report that one of my letters is jamming, and until it can be properly oiled by an F-grade oiler, there is danger of jammed mines. Strawberry jam or raspberry? Charles Wallace murmured. Calvin looked down at Charles and shook his head warningly. Meg gave the little boy's hand a slight understanding pressure. Charles Wallace, she was quite sure, was not trying to be rude or funny. It was his way of whistling in the dark. The man looked at Charles sharply. I think I shall have to report you. I'm fond of children due to the nature of my work, and I don't like to get them in trouble. But rather than run the risk of myself reprocessing, I must report you. Maybe that's a good idea, Charles said. Who do you report us to? To whom do I report you? Well, to whom, then? I'm not on the second grade level yet. I wish he wouldn't act so sure of himself, Meg thought, looking anxiously at Charles and holding his hand more and more tightly until he wriggled his fingers in protest. That's what Mrs. Watson said he had to watch up, to watch, being proud. Don't, pl don't, please don't, she thought hard at Charles Wallace. She wondered if Calvin realized that a lot of the arrogance was bravado. The man stood up, moving jerkily as though he had been sitting for a long time. I hope he isn't too hard on you, he murmured as he led the children toward the empty fourth wall. <clears throat> but I've been reprocessed once, and that was more than enough, and I don't want to get sent to IT. I've never been sent to IT, and I can't risk having that happen. There was again. IT or it. What was this it? <laughs> the man took from his pocket a folder filled with papers of every color. He shuffled through them carefully, finally withdrawing one. I've had several reports to make lately. I shall have to ask for a requisition for more A21 cards. He took the card and put it against the wall. It stood through the marble as though it were being sucked in and disappeared. You may be detained for a few days, the man said, but I'm sure they won't be too hard on you because of your mouth, or you, your youth. Just relax and don't fight, and it will be much easier for you. He went back to his seat, leaving the children standing and staring at the blank wall, and suddenly the wall was no longer there, and they were looking into an enormous room lined with machines. They were not unlike the great computing machines Meg had seen in her science books and that she knew her father sometimes worked with. Some did not seem to be in use, and others' lights were flickering on and off. In one machine, a long tape was being eaten, and another, a series of dot dashes were being punched. Several white ro robed attendants were moving about, tending the machines. If they saw the children, they gave no sign. Calvin muttered something. What? Meg asked him. There's nothing to fear except fear itself, Calvin said. I'm quoting, like Mrs. Who, Meg. I'm scared stiff. So am I. Meg held his hand more tightly. Come on. They stepped into the room with the machines. In spite of the enormous width of the room, it was even longer than it was wide. Perspective made the long rows of machines seem almost to meet. The children walked down the center of the room, keeping as far from the machines as possible. 
No, I don't suppose they're radioactive or anything, Charles Wallace said, or that they're going to reach out and grab us and chew us up. After they had walked for what seemed like miles, they could see that an enormous room did have an end, and that at the end there was something, Charles Wallace said suddenly, and his voice held panic. Don't let go of my hands. Hold me tight. He's trying to get at me. Who? Mike squeaked. I don't know, but he's trying to get in at me. I can feel him. Let's go back. Calvin started to pull away. No, Charles said. I have to go on. We have to make decisions, and we can't make them if they're based on fear. His voice sounded old and strange and remote. Meg, clasping his small hand tightly, could feel it sweating in hers. As they approached the end of the room, their steps slowed. Before them was a platform. On the platform was a chair, and on the chair was a man. What there, what was there about him that seemed to contain all the coldness and darkness they had felt as they plunged through the black thing on their way to this planet? I've been waiting for you, my dears, the man said. His voice was kind and gentle, not at all the cold and frightening voice Meg had expected. It took her a moment to realize that though the voice came from the man, he did not open his mouth or move his lips at all, that no real words had been spoken to fall upon her ears, that he had somehow communicated directly into their brains. But how does it happen that there are three of you, the man asked. Charles Wallace spoke with harsh boldness, but Meg could feel him trembling. Oh, Calvin just came along for the ride. Oh, he did, did he? For a moment, there was a sharpness to the voice that spoke inside their minds, and a relaxing became soothing again. I hope that it has been a pleasant one so far. Very educational, Charles Wallace said. Let Calvin speak for himself, the man ordered. Calvin growled, his lips tight, his body rigid. I have nothing to say. The me Meg stared at the man in horrified sa fa fascination. His eyes were bright and had a reddish glow. Above his head was a light and it glowed in the same manner as the eyes, pulsing, throbbing, in steady rhythm. Charles Walsh shut his eyes tightly. Close your eyes, he said to Meg and Calvin. Don't look at the light. Don't look at his eyes. He'll hypnotize you. Clever, aren't you? Focusing your eyes would, of course, help. The soothing voice went on. But there are other ways, my little man. Oh, yes, there are other ways. If you try it on me, I shall kick you, Charles Walsh said. It was the first thing Meg had ever heard Charles Walsh suggesting violence. Oh, will you? Indeed, my little man. The thought was in was tolerant, amused, but four men in dark smocks appeared and flanked the children. Now, my dears, the words continued, I shall, of course, have no need of recourse to violence, but I thought perhaps it would save you pain if I showed you at once that it would do you no good to try to oppose me. You see, what you will soon realize is that there is no need to fight me. Not only is there no need, but you will not have the slightest desire to do so, for why you should for why should you wish to fight someone who is here only to save you pain and trouble? For you, as well for the rest of all the happy, useful people on this planet, I, in my own strength, am willing to assume all the pain, all the responsibility, all the burdens of thought and decision. We will make our own decisions, thank you, Charles Wallace said. But of course, and our decisions will be one, yours and mine. Don't you see how much better, how much easier is, easier for you, that is? Let me show you. Let us say the multiplication table together. No, Charles Wallace said. Once one is one. Once two is two. Once three is three. Mary had a little lamb, Charles Wallace shouted. Its fleece was white as snow. Once one, once four is four. Once five is five. Once six is six. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Once seven is seven. Once eight is eight. Once nine is nine. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and ten people. Once ten is ten. Once eleven is eleven. Once twelve is twelve. The number of words pounded insistently against Meg's brain. It seemed to be boring away into the sky. Twice one is two. Twice two is four. Twice three is six. Calvin's voice came out in an angry shout. Four score and seven years ago, our father's gone forth on this continent to many nations, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Twice four is eight, twice five is ten, twice six is twelve. Father, make scream, father, the scream, half that involuntary, jerk to mind. <clears throat> Back out of the darkness, the words of the multiplication table seemed to break up into laughter. Splendid, splendid. You have passed your preliminary test with fine colors. You didn't think we were easy, as easy as all that. Falling for that old stuff, did you? Charles Wallace admitted. Uh, I hope not. I was most I most sincerely hope not. But after all, you are very young and very impressionable. 
I mean, the younger the better, my little man. The younger the better. Meg looked up at the fiery eyes, at the light pulsing above them, and then away. She tried looking at the mouth, at the thin, almost colorless lips, and this was more possible even though she had to look obliquely so that she was not sure exactly what the face really looked like, whether it was young or old, cruel or kind, human or alien. If you please, she said, trying to sound calm and brave. The only reason we are here is because we think our father is here. Can you tell us where to find him? Ah, your father. There seems to be a great chortling of delight. Ah, yes, your father. It is not can I, you know, young lady, but will I? Will you then? That depends on a number of things. Why do you want your father? Can't you ever have a father yourself? Meg demanded. You don't want him for a reason. You want him because he's your father. Ah, but he hasn't been acting like a father lately, has he? Abandoning his wife his four, and four little children to go gallivanting off on wild adventures of his own. He was working for the government. He'd never have left us otherwise. And we want to see him. Please, right now. My, but the little miss is impatient. Patience, patience, young lady. Meg did not tell the man on the chair that patience was not one of her virtues. And by the way, my children, he continued blandly, you don't need to vocalize verbally, verbally with me. You know, I can understand you quite as well as you can understand me. Char Charles Wallace put his hands on his hips defiantly. The spoken word is one of the triumphs of man, he proclaimed. I intend to continue using it, particularly with people I don't trust. But his voice was shaking. Charles Wallace, who even as an infant had seldom cried, was near tears. And you don't trust me? What reason have you given us to trust you? What causes have I given you for distrust? The thin lips curled slightly. Suddenly, Charles Wallace darted forward and hit the man as hard as he could, which is fairly hard, as he had a good deal of coaching from the twins. Charles, Meg screamed. The men in dark spots moved smoothly, but with swiftness to Charles. The man in the chair casually raised one finger, and the men dropped back. Hold it, Calvin whispered and together he and Meg darted forward and grabbed Charles Wallace, pulling him back from the platform. The man gave a wince, and the thought of his voice was a little breathless, as though Charles Wallace's punch had succeeded in winning him. May I ask why you did that? Because you aren't you, Charles Wallace said. I'm not sure what you are, but you. He pointed to the man on the chair. Aren't what's talking to us. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I didn't think you were real. I thought perhaps you were a robot, because I don't feel anything coming directly from you. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it's coming through you. It isn't you. Pretty smart, aren't you? The thought asked, and Meg had an uncomfortable feeling that she detected a snarl. It's not that I'm smart, Charles Wallace said, and again Meg could feel the palm of his hand sweating inside hers. Try to find out who I am then, the thought probed. I have been trying, Charles Wallace said, his voice high and troubled. Look into my eyes. Look deep within them. And I will tell you, Charles Wallace looked quickly at Meg and Calvin, then said as though to himself, I have to, and focused his clear blue eyes on the red ones of the man in the chair. Meg looked not at the man, but at her brother. After a moment, it seemed that his eyes were no longer focusing. The pupils grew smaller and smaller as he were looking into an intensely bright light until they seemed to close entirely, until his eyes were nothing but... An opaque blue. He slipped his hands out of Meg's and Calvin's and started walking slowly toward the man on the chair. No, Meg screamed, no. But Charles Wallace continued his slow walk forward and she knew that he had not heard her. No, she screamed again and ran after him. With her in an ineff inefficient flying tackle, she landed on him. She was so much larger than he that he was he fell sprawling, hitting his head on a sharp crack against the marble floor. She knelt by him, sobbing. After a moment of lying there, as though he had been knocked out by the blow, he opened his eyes, shook his head, and sat up. Slowly, the pupils of his eyes dilated until they were back to normal, and the blood came back to his white cheeks. The man on the chair spoke directly into Meg's mind, and now there was a distinct menace to the words. I am not pleased, he said to her. I could very easily lose patience with you, and that, for your information, young lady, would not be good for your father. If you have the slightest desire to see your father again, you had better cooperate. Meg reacted as she sometimes reacted to Mr. Jenkins at school. She scowled down at the ground in sullen fury. It might help if you gave us something to eat, she complained. We are all starved. If you're going to be horrible to us, you might as well give us full stomachs first. 
she got the thoughts coming at her broke into laughter. Isn't she the funny girl, though? It's lucky for you that you amuse me, my dear, or I shouldn't be so easy on you. The boys I find not nearly so diverting. Ah, uh, well, now tell me, young lady, if I feed you, will you stop interfering with me? No, Meg said. Starvation does work wonders, of course, the man told her. I hate to use such primitive methods on you, but of course you realize that you force them on me. I wouldn't eat your old food anyhow. Meg was still all turned up and angry as though she went. She were in Mr. Jenkins' office. I wouldn't trust it. Of course, our food, being synthetic, is not superior to your messes of beans and bacon and so forth. But I assure you that it's far more nourishing, and though it has no taste of its own, a slight conditioning is all that is necessary to give you the illusion that you are eating a roast turkey dinner. If I ate now, I'd throw up anyhow, Meg said. Still holding Meg's and Calvin's hands, Charles Law stepped forward. Okay, what's next? He asked the man in the chair. We've had enough of these preliminaries. Let's get on with it. That's exactly what we are doing, the man said, until your sister interfered by practically giving you a brain concussion. Shall we try again? No, Meg cried. No, Charles, please. Let me do it. Or Calvin. But it is only the little boy whose neurological system is complex enough. If you try to conduct the necessary neurons, your brains would explode. And Charles wouldn't? I think not. But there's a possibility. There's always a possibility. Then he mustn't do it. I think you'll have to grant him the right to make his own decisions. But Meg, with the dogged tenacity that had so often caused her trouble, continued. You mean Calvin and I can't know who you really are? Oh no, I didn't say that. You can't know it in the same way, nor is it as important to me to have you know. Ah, here we are. From somewhere in the shadows appeared four men in dark smocks, carrying a table. It was covered with white cloth, like the tables used on, by room service in hotels and held by a metal pot, hot, hot box containing something that smelled delicious, something that smelled like a turkey dinner. There's something phony in the whole setup, Meg thought. There is definitely something rotten in the state of Camazots. Again, the thoughts seemed to break into laughter. Of course it doesn't really smell, but isn't it as good as though it really did? I don't smell anything, Charles Wallace said. I know, young man, and think how much you're missing. This will all taste to you as though you were eating sand, but I suggest that you force it down. I would rather not have your decisions come from the weakness of an empty stomach. The table was set up in front of them. In the dark, smock men heaped their plates with turkey and dressing and mashed potatoes and gravy and little green peas with big yellow blobs of butter melting in them and cranberries and sweet potatoes topped with gooey brown marshmallows and olives and celery and rosebud radishes and Meg felt her stomach rumbling loudly. The saliva came to her mouth. Oh, Jiminy, Calvin mumbled. Chairs appeared, and the four men who had provided the feast slid back into the shadows. Charles Wallace freed his hands from Meg and Calvin and plunked himself down on one of the chairs. Come on, he said. If it's poisoned, it's poisoned. But I don't think it is. Calvin sat down. Meg continued to stand indecisively. Calvin took a bite. He chewed. He swallowed. He, he looked at Meg. If it isn't real, it's the best imitation you'll ever get. Charles Wallace took took a bite, made a face, and spit out his mouthful. It's unfair, he shouted at the man. Laughter again. Go on, little fellow, eat. Meg sighed and sat down. I don't think you should eat this stuff, but if you're going to, I'd better too. She took a mouthful. Tastes all right. Try some of mine, Charles. She held out a forkful of tur turkey. Charles Wallace took it, made another face, but managed to swallow. Still tastes like sand, he said. He looked at the man. Why? You know perfectly well why. You shut your mind entirely to me. The other two can't. I can get in through the chinks. Not all the way in, but enough to get them a turkey dinner, you see. I'm really just a kind, jolly old gentleman. Ha, Charles said. The man lifted his lips into a smile, and his smile was the most horrible thing Meg had ever seen. Why don't you trust me, Charles? Why don't you trust me enough to come in and find out what I am? I am peace and utter rest. I am freedom from all responsibility. To come into me is the last difficult decision you need to ever make. If I come in and I get... If I... Can come in. Can I get out again? Charles Wallace asked. But of course, if you want to. But I don't think you'll want to. If I come, not to stay, you understand, just to find out about you, will you tell us where Father is? Yes, that is a promise. And I don't make promises lightly. Can I speak to Meg and Calvin alone without you your listening in? No. Charles shrugged. Listen, he said to Meg and Calvin. I have to find out what he really is. You know that. I'm going to try to hold back. I'm going to try to keep part of myself out. You mustn't stop me this time, Meg. 
but you won't be able to, Charles. He's stronger than you are. You know that. I have to try. But Mrs. Wilson warned you. I have to try. For Father, Meg. Please. I want I want to know my father. For a moment his lips trembled, then he was back in control. But it isn't only Father, Meg. You know that now. It's the black thing. We have to do what Mrs. Witch sent us to do. Calvin, Meg begged. For Calvin shook his head. He's right, Meg. And we'll be with him no matter what happens. What's going to happen, Meg cried. Charles Wallace looked at the man. Okay, he said, let's go. Now the red eyes and the light above seemed to bore into Charles, and again the pupils of the little boy's eyes contracted. When the final point of black was lost in the blue, he turned away from the red eyes, looked at Meg, and smiled sweetly. But the smile was not Charles Wallace's smile. Come on, Meg, eat this delicious food that has been prepared for us, he said. Meg snatched Charles Wallace's plate and threw it on the floor, so that the dinner splashed about, and the plate broke into fragments. No, she cried, her voice writhing shrilly. No, no, no. From the shadows came one of the dark, smart men and put another plate in front of Charles Wallace, and he began to eat eagerly. What's wrong, Meg? Charles Wallace. Why are you being so belligerent and uncooperative? The voice of Charles Wallace's voice, and yet it was different, too, somehow flattened out, almost as a voice might have sounded on the two-dimensional planet. Meg grabbed wildly at Calvin, shrieking, That isn't Charles. Charles is gone.